What do these five characters have in common? Mm. Charlie Brown, mm. uh, Ratbert, Wiley Coyote, Sisyphus, and Uncle Sam. Now, maybe you figured Uncle Sam would be in my characters. He didn't. He's not amused at all by this company. What they have in common, okay? Um, it's not competence. It's not cuddliness. It's not intelligence. Nor is it love of neighbor. No, what they have in common is that they keep making the same mistake over and over and over. Charlie Brown trusts Lucy to hold the football. Uh, and then he goes flying. And again. Ratbert is proud of his friend Dilbert. Uh, sorry, proud of his friend Dogbert. But Dogbert has no friends, and if he did have friends, Ratbert wouldn't be one of them. He just shamelessly uses Ratbert. Then we got Wiley Coyote uh, uh, with his clever schemes one after another to catch the roadrunner, but they always end usually over the edge of a cliff, and uh, Wiley gets another gravity lesson. Then we got Sisyphus, uh, condemned for eternity to roll a boulder up a hill. He's, he, if he could just get it up once, he could go free, but it always breaks loose. And there he has to go again and again and again. Now Uncle Sam. He suffers recurring financial debacles, and he vows reform. Uh, he does what his most trusted experts recommend. And then he suffers another financial debacle. And he vows reform. And he really means it this time, just like he really meant it last time. And so, you know, his most trusted experts, of course, are the regulators. And they have a favorite solution, uh, which is to give the, that Uncle Sam give them more discretionary powers. Give them the tools, and they'll do the job next time, and we go through the whole thing again. I've lived through this myself a couple times in the last, last two decades, um, the, um, uh, doing that on Capitol Hill. Um, so here are my key points. Um, regulators had ample powers to keep banks safe, but they did not adequately use those powers. And a key reason they didn't adequately use them is that they faced perverse incentives to be lax during good times, the, kind, the times when you can lay uh, preventive action, prevent problems from growing uh, or being in a position to grow large. Um, a, and a very key factor in these perverse incentives is that there is no political constituency for bank soundness regulation until it's too late. To fix the system, we need to give regulators a better set of incentives. So my remarks are going to be in three parts. Uh, uh, just take a quick look at regulators' discretionary powers to emphasize how, uh, um, how powerful they are. And that'll just, I'll just be giving you a sample, but it'll, it'll give you the idea. Then to focus on the incentives for regulatory laxity, and then I'll point uh, to some of our prescriptions for reforms. Regulators had ample powers to keep banks safe. And here are just a few of them. Um, uh, it's really sort of horrifying um, uh, when, you, when you focus on all the details of it. And I had something to do with some of those powers. And when I started teaching about it and sort of thinking about due process, it was troubling. Anyway, they have total access uh, to a bank's in information. They can scrutinize the bank's operations, uh, deny applications, take uh, enforcement action, and just, just give you a little bit of a sense uh, 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 of more. This is, I'm going to show you here quickly, one-third of the short form uh, 
quarterly report for a U.S. bank with no foreign operations. And let me assure you, this is as detailed as any page of your income tax uh, return, uh, uh, the, the various pages of this. Uh, on top of that, agencies can fine bankers or banks uh, up to uh, $1 million per violation per day. Um, and they can remove bankers from office. And if they do, uh, that means an automatic lifetime bar uh, on employment in the banking industry. Not to mention the shame of it all, uh, if indeed this sort of uh, enforcement action is taken against you. So here's, here's something of what we get. Uh, when you have the latest debacle. I'm calling it the dance of the powers. It's less graceful than the dance of the hours. Um, Congress says, how could this happen? And the regulators say, a perfect storm. Who could have expected it? A 500-year flood, even if it was just five years ago, 20 years ago, as Simon talks about. Um, and then uh, and, and the industry says, too, perfect storm. You know, who, how could we have expected, you know, property values would go down and so many borrowers would default. Uh, so we need more discretionary powers, the regulators say. Congress, oh, take a dozen and don't let this happen again. Regulators, you can count on us next time. So what regulators seek and what they get again and again, we saw this in 1989, 1991, uh, in, in the more recent debacles, is more discretionary power without more accountability. Uh, we've been through it over and over again. It's more of the same. We've got the same therapist uh, 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 with the same inadequate cures. And here's Charlie Brown in midlife. Uh, Lucy still doing her part. The patient has not improved. Um, so uh, one thing that's an, that, that uh, as an example of, of where regulators have neglected to do what they could and should have done uh, involves capital. Um, basic idea, uh, oh well, sorry, I'm going to um, just summarize a couple things here. They should have increased required capital levels during two, day, two decades of prosperity and record bank profits. They should have used the risk-based capital standards to limit banks' investments in the worst mortgage-backed securities, like the ones backed by the mortgages where the, the borrower couldn't pay once you got off the teaser rate. Um, to curb other concentrations of credit risk, as Congress had in fact ordered the regulators to do, uh, to limit banks' exposure to the largest financial firms so that we could, um, we could uh, stay away uh, from too big to fail type treatment um, and require the largest firms to offer additional capital. So capital, the difference between assets and liabilities, uh, important uh, in reducing the risks banks will fail, uh, uh, provides a buffer against losses, protects depositors and the FDIC, uh, and uh, reduces moral hazard. Um, so required capital levels, the ones that are still on the books now, were set back in 1988, um, sorry, uh, and uh, uh, at a time when the banking system was weak. And, um, and they haven't been increased since. And, and that reflects the political context in which regulators operate. Congress ordered, uh, 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 ordered the Fed to establish exposure limits on all banks, on their exposure to other banks to avoid too big to fail treatment. And, uh, the Fed uh, 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 prescribed something that's mushy and uh, has been ineffective, uh, essentially subverted the statute. Um, so the key underlying failure here, uh, uh, something that's not appreciated, is regulators' perverse incentives. Uh, we commonly assume that regulators face a benign or neutral set of incentives. In fact, they face significant perverse incentives. And these in incentives arise from special interest politics uh, and also from the nature of banking. Special interest politics, you got benefits concentrated in banks, owners, and managers. And um, uh, by contrast, the taxpayers uh, face costs, but it's spread over a lot of people.